We are so glad to have you with us for our third noon session on prayer during the 2021 Holy Week Revival. I want to remind you that these noon sessions are just one hour. That way, if you're watching online or nearby, you can come, plan your work day, and get back to work. The cafe is also providing sack lunches, and that way you can arrange that through the cafe and grab a lunch on your go when you head back to work or wherever you're going. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for insight into your word. And I thank you for today and Thursday and Friday. I thank you for questions being answered. I thank you for insight. I thank you for understanding. I thank you for revelation. And I thank you, anyone here with us, anyone watching online, listening online, I thank you for them receiving the answer to their question or questions. As our heart's desire is to walk more closely with you and to pray more effectively. And we give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. If you're watching online, be sure to click share. So far, we have learned, number one, that when we pray, we're to pray according to the Word of God, we're to pray according to the Bible. And so whatever you're praying about, whatever the need is, whatever the situation is, whatever the concern is, whoever you're praying for, find two or three scriptures that cover the need, that cover the situation, that cover whoever it is, whatever it is you're praying about. Number two, we've learned, number two, when you pray, pray that needs would be met. Your needs and the needs of others. Yes, it's fine that we pray about our own needs and our own concerns, but our prayer life should also extend beyond ourselves to others, to those in need, to our church family, to our nation, to the leaders of our nation, and to the world. Number three, you can pray with confidence and faith when you know God's will, which is his word. And as we learned yesterday, if somebody were to say, well, Austin, I don't know what the will of God is about healing, or I don't know what the will of God is about our needs being met, well, then they're responsible for that. So you got to get into the word of God and find out what the word says and find out what God's will is regarding whatever it is. It is the need, whatever it is, is the situation you're praying about, you got to find out God's will from his word. And as I encouraged you yesterday, Jesus said in Matthew 21, beginning in verse 21, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever, say whatever, whatever you ask for in prayer. So if you believe, and then tying in verse 21, if you believe or if you have faith and do not doubt, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. And again, as I said yesterday, this is why pastor is always challenging us to use our faith daily, to exercise our faith daily. Don't wait for a big problem or a big challenge to learn how faith works or to learn how prayer works. If you cannot use your faith on small things, how are you going to use your faith on big things? And so, for instance, if a bill comes in the mail unexpectedly, and say it's just $1,000, if you can't use your faith and pray and see that $1,000 need be met, well, how are you going to believe God regarding $10,000 or whatever it is? Or say... Maybe, you know, it's, it, we live in Texas. It can be nice and sunny one day, and then it's chilly and you need a jacket the next. And any of us can get caught being out and about, not dressed the way we should, not having a jacket on or whatnot. So if you got the sniffles or a cold or whatever it is, if you cannot use your faith and pray to be healed of a cold, how are you going to use your faith and pray regarding a greater physical challenge? So the best thing is to learn how faith works and how prayer works and use faith and prayer on a daily basis. And when you do that and live the way you should, generally there aren't big challenges to be overcome. The people that have one big mountain after another, they're not living by faith on a daily basis. They're not working God's plan on a daily basis. So learn how faith and prayer works and use faith and prayer daily 
on daily things. And you might say, well, these things aren't a big deal. Still, use your faith and pray to see those needs be met. Number four, you'll have whatsoever you say in prayer. Say, I will have whatsoever I say when I pray. Say, I will have whatsoever I say when I pray. So as we learn, you must say when you pray. Prayer is conversation. We speak, we listen, it is conversation. And again, as I said yesterday, you don't get your way or get better results by shouting or screaming or acting crazy. You know, as I mentioned yesterday, our, our children have learned how to get what they, they want. You know, and Samuel, he'll come, up, he'll come up to me and he'll say, you know, Daddy, I've been really good this week and, you know, can you, can you get me another Star Wars toy or can you get me another Star Trek toy or whatever it is. He knows how to work and get what he wants. He knows how to receive. Julia is three years old, and as a three-year-old, sometimes she can be very sweet, but sometimes she can uh, demonstrate and exercise her will and throw what is called a tantrum. But she has never once gotten what she wants throwing a tantrum. I've never once seen her throwing a fit and thought, I just want to bless you with something. So if we can't act that way when we're three and get results, if we can't act that way when we're 10 and get results, why would we think we're going to get results from our Heavenly Father in prayer by shouting at Him, screaming at Him, throwing a tantrum, or acting crazy or nuts? Prayer is conversation. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three 23, that we will have whatsoever we saith. You shall have. Whatsoever you say it. Say, I will have whatsoever I say when I pray. So you've got to speak. You've got to, you've got to be vocal. And again, it's not shouting or screaming. It's simply using your voice and talking to the Lord in conversation like you would talk to me or talk to someone, just talk to someone else. And getting to new ground, number five, and we left off with number five yesterday, Getting to new ground, number five, pray with confidence, knowing our Heavenly Father wants to give you good things. Say good things. Good things. Matthew 6 and verse 8, do not be like them. Who is Jesus referring to? Pagans, unbelievers, those that don't know the Lord. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. How good is He? He knows what we need even before we ask. And he wants to bless us with what we need or desire before we even ask. But as we learn, we have to ask. Matthew 7, verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil... And again, Jesus is not being mean or unkind to us as human beings. Even when we're born again, even when we're full of the Holy Spirit, we're still not perfect. Now, I know that may come as a shock, but even when we're born again, even when we're filled with the Spirit, we're not perfect. But he said, if you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will our Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So we have to ask, but our Heavenly Father wants to bless us with good gifts, good things. And what things does our Heavenly Father want to bless us with? Turn back a chapter to Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. And again, you, you just got to get out of your life and out of your mind and out of your heart all of the religious prejudices you might have been taught, all of the religious prejudices you might have been raised with. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? So if we would have the eyes of faith to see this, we would realize that provision isn't any big deal. We, we come to the place where in our minds we think it's a big deal, and that if, you know, somehow God takes us from shopping at the Gap 
to going to somewhere nicer that we're going to bankrupt heaven. Provision is not a big deal. Provision is not a big deal. And you might be at a place in your life where it is to you, but provision to our Heavenly Father isn't any big deal. The limits are here, and the limits are here. And that's why we've got to renew our minds to the Word of God. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. I've never once seen a group of birds gathered around in a circle having a support therapy group. Worry, concern, and even squirrels as skittish as they are. There's no such thing as a squirrel enrolling in therapy. Our Heavenly Father feeds them. They are fed, they are provided for, they are taken care of. Are you not much more valuable than they? Say, I'm more valuable. Okay. Say it again. Say, I'm more valuable. I'm more valuable. And see, religion convinces people that they're not valuable. Religion convinces people that they're not worthy. Religion convinces people that something is too good or it's too nice for them and God doesn't want them to have it. But we're, we're more valuable than anything else in all of God's creation. We're more valuable. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? So worry is contrary to faith. Worry is a hindrance to faith and answered prayer. Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon. And why does he mention Solomon? Because Solomon was one of the richest men who ever lived. Not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So see, when we're worried about everyday provision, Jesus defines that as being little faith. And as pastor has dealt with during the weeks of increase in August, we ought to get to the place where we have mastered provision. We ought to get to the place where we have mastered worldly provision. And Jesus says that if we have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, worldly matters, who will trust us with true riches? But a lot of believers spend their entire lives and they never figure out how to master provision. They never, they never learn how to walk in the provision that God has for them. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Will he not much more clothe you? Will he not much more clothe me of little faith? And so we have to lift up our eyes. We have to believe him for more and realize he wants to bless us with good gifts. He wants to bless us with good things. And when our heavenly father wants to clothe us, I mean, think about how he has clothed the birds of the field. And they're beautiful. Now, not all birds are beautiful. We get black ravens in our yard. I wouldn't say they're beautiful. But does our Heavenly Father want to clothe us with rags? Does our Heavenly Father want to clothe us with things where when you sit down, the seam pulls apart? Not because of weight, but because it's poorly made. Amen. He, he wants, we're valuable. Say, I'm valuable. Say, say it again. Say, I'm valuable. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? You know, growing up, my parents always laughed at, I was always concerned about the next meal. And I've never once not, I've never missed a meal except for one. And that was when my mom, I don't know, I would have been maybe 10 or 12, and she was making something, and I asked what was for dinner, and apparently didn't like what was for dinner. And I made a comment, and my father was in the, the room next door, and he said, well, you can go to bed without dinner. So once I did miss dinner, I am not done without, amen? But, you know, growing up, I'd always want to know, when, when's the next meal? Where are we having the next meal? Michaela's the same way. She always wants to know, where are we eating tomorrow? What's the next meal? What are we going to have? But again, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans? Who? The pagans. So we ought not be like unbelievers. 
The pagans run or chase after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Say, he knows, he knows. I need them. So there's a, there's a belief out there, there's a lie out there that as the children of God, we're supposed to do without. And we're not supposed to have anything. And we're supposed to be in need and lack and in want. And we're supposed to be the tail and not the head. And that if we do have something, it shouldn't be as nice as something any worldly person might have. But that's not what Jesus taught us. Our Heavenly Father knows that we have need of things. And he wants to bless us with good things. He wants to bless us with good gifts. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. What things? Food, clothes, provision, the necessities of life, the things that people in the world put first and chase after and live their entire lives seeking to inquire. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given or added unto you as well. As I said yesterday, the place we're living in because of the, the road that pastor has led us down is blessings are added unto us. And not only are they being added unto us, blessings are chasing us down. They're chasing us down. They're chasing us down before we even have the opportunity to pray about it or put it on a prayer list. Verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So verse 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. Say things. things. So again, you've got to give up any religious prejudice that your heavenly father doesn't want you to have things or he doesn't want you to have nice things. Or if it's too nice, he doesn't want you to have it. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given or added to you as well. So how much or how many? All these things. Say all. all. Food, clothes, provision, the necessities of life. So it is not wrong or unspiritual or ungodly to have things. The issue is when things have you or when things have your heart, or when you care, about, you care more about things than your family, or your husband or wife, or your children, or other people, or those in need, or the kingdom of God. Our Heavenly Father knows that we have need of things. And as we saw, you go back to one of the first verses I gave you, Matthew 6, 8, He knows what we need before we even ask Him. He knows that we are in need of things, and He knows what we need before we even ask Him. So we are to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given or added. Say added unto us as well. So there's the mentality that serving God you're going to do without. And people have it wrong. People have it backwards. When you come to the family of God, the things that you have to give up are things that are wrong. Sinful lifestyles, sinful habits, bad attitudes, that's the cost. Giving up what is unrighteous and ungodly and worldly. But when you give up those things, God is going to bless you all the days of your life in the plus column. Things will be added unto you. And if we're doing it right, if we're bearing good fruit in our lives, there ought to be more things being added unto us in 2021 than the things that were added to us in 2020. We ought to be making progress, amen? These things will be added unto you as well. So what things, do I, what things does our Heavenly Father want to bless us with? Food, clothes, provisions, the necessities of life, the money we need, a place to live, a roof over your head, reliable, say reliable, reliable. transportation. So does our Heavenly Father only want to bless us with the bare minimum? No, he wants us to have the best. I gave you already Isaiah 119, if we're willing and obedient. Say obedient. obedient. Say willing. willing. And part of the problem is we're not always willing because we're, we're, we're concerned about what a family member might think. We're concerned about what other people will say about us. If we're willing and obedient, we'll eat what? The leftovers. What the world has is leftovers. We'll eat out of the dumpster. We'll eat... What do you say we'll eat? The best. the best. Now, I realize that the best is whatever is the best to you. It is preference. And what's the best to you may not be what's best to me. You know, when I was in high school, 
I love to eat at places like Taco Bell or uh, Candlelight Inn or wherever. But to me, if, if somebody says, hey, Austin, you want to go have Tex-Mex, Taco Bell is not the best of the land. So the best is whatever is the best to you. And that changes over time as you grow up and mature. Amen. You know, praise God, our future will not be eating at Taco Bell all the days of our lives. And again, if you like Taco Bell, work at Taco Bell. I have nothing against Taco Bell. We ate a lot of meals there in junior high and high school. The best is whatever is the best to you. And God will meet you at whatever level you can believe him at. I gave you Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith. Say my faith. My faith. So it's not according to Pastor Gene's faith or Austin's faith. It's not even according, there are a lot of young people here, it's not even according to your parents' faith. According to whose faith will it be done in your life? According to your faith. Say, my faith. My faith. So our Heavenly Father will not force blessings on unwilling children. He will not force blessings on unwilling children. And He will not make you walk at a level you don't want to walk at. We've got to be not just obedient, but willing. We have to cooperate. And he will meet you at whatever level you can believe him at. According to your faith, say, my faith, my faith. will it be done unto you? So despite what you may have been told, God does not care what it costs. Despite what you may have been told, God does not care what it costs. And whatever it is, it's not going to bankrupt God. You know, whatever you ask the Lord for, if he answers you, it's not as if that's the only prayer that heaven can answer for the rest of the day. And if God meets the need or God pays the bill or God blesses you with the desire of your heart, that doesn't mean that heaven is tapped out for the rest of the month. It's amazing the sort of thinking and prejudices we, we buy into to make other people happy or to feel good about just staying at the level we've been at for a year or five years or longer. Our Heavenly Father does not care what it costs. About a month ago, we had crazy, crazy weather here in Texas. And it was cold. It was not just a little cold. It was basically zero degrees. And I know that the wonderful people in government who always tell the truth, and we can always trust no matter what, right? They said that the power would be on, and then it would go off for 45 minutes, and then it would be back on for 45. I mean, they told us, they, they, they tell the truth, right? But out of all the people at FCC and St. Paul's I've talked to, I only know of one person that actually had it like that, where their power was on 45 minutes, then off 45 minutes, then back on 45 minutes. And so when Jessica and I, we woke up that Monday morning, our power was off, and we thought, well, they had said it's going to be back on in 45 minutes, and it didn't. And then later we found out from a neighbor that our power had actually been off since sometime during the middle of the night, and it was cold, and things were frozen, and we're thankful that we didn't have anything inside that, needed, that was damaged or needed to be fixed. But when I went outside and tried to do the steps the pool company gave us at the pool equipment, it was too many hours had gone by. It was cold. It was frozen. And so the situation was what the situation was. But when my father found out about it, I, I didn't ask him for anything. I, you know, when he found out about it, he just said, Austin, I don't care what it costs. I'll cover it. He said, I don't care what it costs. I will cover it. Again, what Jesus said, if we being evil or not perfect, give good gifts unto our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? And so again, we, we get into our minds that, it, that it, okay, if we ask the Lord for this, it's okay, but if we ask the Lord for that, it is too nice. Or if we ask the Lord for that, it, it's, no longer in, it's no longer spiritual. And you've got to give up any of that thinking. It is a wrong religious mindset to think that a certain brand is spiritual and something else is unspiritual. Now, I, I realize when we talk about something like clothes, not everything is appropriate. Amen. So it may be unspiritual. That said, it is a wrong religious mindset that a certain brand is spiritual and then something else that's a different brand is unspiritual. It is a wrong religious mindset that a two-bedroom house is 
spiritual, and humble. But if you get a three-bedroom house, suddenly you have become unspiritual. It's perspective. It is attitude. And God will meet you at whatever level you can believe Him at. He will meet you at whatever level you can believe Him at. And He, he believes in plenty. He believes in more than enough. You read the story of Isaac. Isaac was not satisfied with one well. He kept digging one well after another. Why? In the Middle East, you cannot have too many wells. And how can your livestock grow if you don't have enough water? How can they multiply if you don't have enough water? It's perspective. It is attitude. God will meet you at whatever level you can believe Him at. And people don't think things through. They have religious mindsets, they have religious prejudices, and they don't think things through. You know, in Texas, the state of Texas, $100,000 may seem like a lot of money. But in New York City or San Francisco, $100,000 doesn't go as far. You know, if you had $100,000, maybe you inherited $100,000 and you thought, well, I'm going to go to Manhattan and I'm going to look in one of those high rises and I can see what I can buy. You would be living in the basement, in a closet, in the basement. So we get in our minds that this is a lot or, or this is big or this is too much and it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of attitude. Years ago, there was a family in the church and you know, it's amazing how people just say they're doing something. They don't ask you. They don't ask your thoughts or opinion and they don't ask the Lord before they make major decisions in life. You should always ask the Lord before you make any major decision. You know, once there was a man and he had worked for the U.S. Postal Service. He was a year away from full retirement. He was a year away from their home being paid off. But a year away, he decided that he was going to go work for his brother-in-law in California. Well, even an unsaved, unspiritual person could say, brother, that's not going to go well. And so he gave up retiring at full retirement. He gave up the home in Texas that was nearly paid off and went to California. Well, everything in California costs more. Yes. And whatever a home that is a certain size in Texas costs, it costs a lot more yes. in California. Right. And so again, not asking the Lord what to do, not seeking advice. So years ago, there was a family that just announced that they were going to move to the Northeast. They were going to move to New Jersey. Well, they did all that without first counting the cost. And Jesus taught in Luke 14 that before you make major decisions in life, you have to count the cost. Tell your neighbor, say, count the cost. Count the cost. Tell your other neighbor, say, count the, count the cost. You have to count the cost. You know, Texas versus New Jersey. What are the taxes in New Jersey? What is the cost of living in New Jersey? Is there a state income tax? See, these are things to think about and pray about and ask the Lord about and ask wise people about before you make a major decision. But people don't ask when they know. No one has ever once come to me or Aaron or Pastor or Pastor Sue and said, hey Austin, do you think I should marry Beelzebub? No. Because they know the answer is no. Brother, it is not a good idea. Or sister, it is not a good idea that you marry Beelzebub. So why don't they ask? Why don't they introduce us to him? Why don't they want us to do the premarital counseling? Why don't they want us to do the service? Because they know what we're going to say. And so you got to count the cost. And so they made this major decision without counting the cost and got there and realized, well, everything is more. Well, how did they pay for part of the cost? Well, here in Texas, their, their children had been in St. Paul's, but they made these major decisions without counting the cost. So to pay for part of the cost, they put their daughters in public school in New Jersey. Well, that's not like public school out in the country in Texas. See, faith and prosperity and walking in the blessing of God, it's for our family. It's for our families. It's for our children. And our children shouldn't pay the price for our poor decisions and us not learning how to walk by faith or pray to see that needs be met or whatever it is. 
So you have to count the cost. And before every major decision of life, you should always pray first. You should pray and ask the Lord what to do before every major decision of life. And I, I believe strongly in always following the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter if I'm going to eat at a restaurant and that I, I feel a strong urge, don't go there, go somewhere else. Well, the Holy Spirit knows if there's someone in the back preparing the food that is deathly sick or whatever the issue is. So I'm a big believer in asking the Lord what to do first. It's better to ask first than to say, Lord, I need your help fixing this major emergency. Pray before every major decision of life. And somebody might say, well, Austin, you don't know what it costs. Well, friends, this is why we believe in faith, and this is why we believe in prosperity. With your faith and knowing how to pray, your every need can be met, and your every need can be met with plenty left over. You know, when Sophie first started at St. Paul's, at the time it seemed like a lot, but it's nothing compared to paying for four children now. And here at some point, it's going to be five. And so everybody knows we get, we get the same employee discount that everybody else does. There's no special Austin Lingerfeld discount. But we just pray and believe it in, and it's no big deal. Now again, I realize somebody might be shocked by that, but it's perspective. Tell your neighbor, say, it's perspective. It's perspective. Tell your other neighbor, say, it's attitude. And it ain't no big deal to God. Now again, in our mind or in our heart, we can act like this or that's a big deal, but it ain't a big deal to God. It ain't a big deal to heaven. God's not going to go broke if he answers the need. God's not going to go broke if he gives you the desire of your heart, whatever it is. God's not going to go broke if he does this or that for you or for your family or for your children or for your business. In 2004, in the series Men of Destiny, which a man in the church recently mentioned in a testimony, my father did a message called The Six-Figure Man. But friends, that was in 2004. And because of what our government has done, $100,000 in 2004 is not what $100,000 is in 2021. And if you don't realize that, just go car shopping. What you could get with $100,000 in 2004, it is not what you can get in 2021. So again, with money, with things, it is perspective. It is attitude. So make up your mind to not be offended about this or that, or this or that amount of money. God will meet you at whatever level you can believe him at. It's perspective. You know, once I was eating in Fort Worth and after lunch came out, and uh, saw the vehicle parked next to me. It was an F-450 King Ranch Dually. I didn't even know such a thing existed. Now I knew about an F-150 King Ranch and a Super Duty King Ranch, but this was an F-450 King Ranch. And I, it was a work truck Dually. I'm sure somebody that really uses it as a work truck, but it was nice. I could tell it was nice. So I got online and I went to the Ford website, and I configured what an F-450 Dually King Ranch costs. Well, my, even my eyebrows went up, <laughs> because the reality is that costs more than a lot of the nice European stuff. But see, you could have someone with a religious mindset, and they, they see the truck, and they don't think anything of it, and next to it's a European sedan or whatever it is, and they think, well, well, that's spiritual, and that's humble, but this is arrogant, this is prideful, and this is unspiritual. And that is religious thinking. It is religious prejudice. It'll hold you back. You just got to eliminate all of that nonsense from your life. It's perspective. When I was in the doctoral program in seminary, one day uh, one of the professors told me that he wanted to have lunch to get to know me better. And so I went to chapel and then met him at his office after chapel and we walked to his car. And, uh, you know, I I'm cool. And uh, he was acting kind of odd. And I, at first, I couldn't figure it out. And we got in his car, and he began to profusely apologize. He said, you know, Austin, I don't want you to think anything negative about what I'm driving. And he then explained how he and his wife had worked hard their whole lives, how they had saved, 
how they had just finished putting their children through college. They had just finished putting their youngest daughter through A&M. They had paid every bill and, and paid off the, the college tuition. And so they had a bunch of money freed up. And so he went and got what was his dream and was his desire, which was the top of the line Toyota sedan with leather. But because of that denominational environment, he thought I would, I would judge him for driving that car. And I thought, man, you don't know me at all. <laughs> but again, Jesus said we're to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. But again, it doesn't make any difference to the Lord whether a brother wants the Toyota or he wants the Lexus or whether someone wants the Honda or someone wants the Acura. He will meet you at whatever is your level of faith. And there's nothing more spiritual about this or less spiritual about that. Although, as you let the Lord bless you with nicer, I've learned it's easier to believe God and to be in faith because you don't get in whatever you're driving and be bummed out. Certain things are contrary to faith. I think Oral Roberts said it, that you can't think big thoughts in a little office. So no, you can't take your $100,000 and uh, set up shop in Manhattan. You're going to be in the basement, in the closet, and you can't think big thoughts in the basement, in the closet. So you've got to get past and give up prejudices. As the cost of living goes up, as, inflation, as there is inflation, you've got to get past and give up all religious prejudices. And all religious prejudices, if you're going to walk in the blessing of the Lord, if you're going to walk in His blessing, if you're going to prosper and have your needs met with more than enough, you got to give up religious prejudice. He will meet you at whatever level you can believe Him at. And our Heavenly Father doesn't care what it costs. He doesn't care what it costs. You may think it's too much, but He doesn't. You may think, somebody may have led you to believe you're not worthy of it but our Heavenly Father thinks you're worthy. You may have been led to believe you don't deserve it, but our Heavenly Father thinks you deserve it. And you can pray with confidence knowing our Heavenly Father wants to give you good things. Say, He wants to give me good things. Wants to give me good things. Say it again. Say, He wants to give me good things. Wants to give me good things. The Bible tells us that our Heavenly Father, He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The silver and gold belong to Him. The streets in heaven are streets of gold. The Bible says pure gold. They're not gold pavers. It's not like when you go to Home Depot now, instead of buying tile, you can buy tile stickers. <laughs> now again, don't, don't be offended. You can buy tile stickers to put on concrete to where it looks like tile, but it ain't. They don't have gold stickers in heaven. The Bible says the streets are pure gold. The city is pure gold. Our Heavenly Father does not care what it costs. He wants you to have the desires of your heart. And according to your faith will it be done unto you. But people get it into their heads that this or that isn't spiritual or that if it costs this amount of money, it's no longer spiritual. And that's nonsense. According to your faith, will it be done unto you? Say, according to my faith. So our Heavenly Father, He'll meet you at whatever level you can believe Him at. So you got to lift up your eyes. Tell your neighbors, say, lift up your eyes. Tell your other neighbors, say, lift up your eyes. Part of receiving in faith and part of receiving in prayer is relaxing in faith and resting in faith and knowing that the answer is yes. And knowing that our Heavenly Father has heard and answered, and as John says, that we have what we have asked of Him. Part of receiving from God is knowing He wants us to have our dreams and desires. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give unto you the desires of your heart. Now, people say things like, well, Austin, God only, you know, when people talk like real slow, like the way no one talks, our children watch Finding Nemo and Finding Dory. So when people talk like Finding Nemo or Finding Dory, it, it's just nonsense. Well, Austin, you know, God only wants to 
meet your needs, not your wants, not your desires. They need to read their Bible. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give unto you the desires of whose heart? Your heart. Part of receiving from God is knowing that he wants to bless us with good things. If you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will our Father in heaven give good things or good gifts to those who ask? So pray with confidence knowing our Heavenly Father wants to give you good things. Now how do you believe for a desire of your heart? First, you've got to know that God wants you to have your desire as long as it is consistent with His Word and a godly lifestyle. Then you ask, number two, you ask once in faith. Then third, you believe you receive until you have the manifestation. You believe you receive thanking and praising God for it until you have the manifestation. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty four. 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you receive it and it will be yours. It's that simple. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. The King James, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Asking more than once is contrary to faith. If you ask God more than once, you don't believe he heard you or answered you. If you ask more than once, you don't believe that you have what you have asked for. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you receive it and it will be yours. So no, he wants you to have your desire as long as it's consistent with his word and a godly life. Ask once in faith, then believe you receive, thanking him and praising him that you have it until you have the physical manifestation. And it helps, it is good. And if you want results, be specific when you pray. You know, sometimes a young man will approach uh, my father and me, he'll ask how to believe for a wife. Got to be specific. Do you want Beelzebub or are you looking for something else? And recently a young man approached me and he asked how to believe God for a car. And I told him to get David Young, he chose book, The Fourth Dimension. Because in that book, he tells it perfectly, better than I could ever tell it, about how he was a pastor starting out in South Korea in those days. It was very impoverished. They were very poor. They, they had nothing. His church consisted of his wife and children and his mother-in-law, and that was basically it. And as a pastor with nothing, he was simply believing God for a, a desk and a bicycle and a chair. And he didn't understand how he had prayed and prayed and prayed and how God had not given him a desk, a bicycle, or a chair. And so he went to the Lord about it. And the Lord corrected him in prayer and said, you've got to be specific. What kind of desk do you want? What kind of bicycle do you want? What kind of chair do you want? Another young man once approached me and he said he wanted, to be in he wanted me to be in agreement with him about getting a car. I said, what kind of car? He didn't know. Well, for us to be in agreement, we got to be able to be in agreement. And so I teased him and I said, well, are you believing for a pink Volkswagen bug with some flowers on it? What? What, what, what are you believing for? So be specific when you pray. Matthew 7, 11, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will our Father in heaven give good gifts or things to those who ask? Our heavenly Father will meet you at whatever level you can believe him at. So lift up your eyes and believe him for more. And remember that this world is not our home. The Bible says that we are aliens, we are strangers, we are foreigners passing through. So the truth is, we are ambassadors in this world. And ambassadors live at the level of the country they are from. They don't live at the level of the place they are assigned to. We are ambassadors. And that's part of lifting up your eyes, is learning how in this life to live at a higher level and higher level, so when you cross over, it's not that much of a surprise. Ambassadors live at the level of the country they're from. And if you'll, you'll, you'll see this and understand this, then God wants to do so much more in all of our lives, in all of our circumstances. 
Does he only want to bless us with the bare minimum? No. He wants us to have our desires. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. He wants to give us good things. As Jesus said, Matthew 6 and verse 8, our Father knows what we need before we even ask. Matthew 7, 11, how much more will he give good gifts to those who ask? He does not want us to be in lack or in need with not enough. He wants us to be blessed. He wants every need to be met with plenty left over. James 1.17 says, every good. Say good and perfect. Say perfect. perfect. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. It's Satan who steals and kills and destroys. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life. As James says, every good and perfect gift is from where? Above. Every blessing is from above. Every good thing is from above. So pray with confidence knowing our Heavenly Father wants to give you good things. Psalm 23, 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Say, all of my days. All of my days. Say, I will have goodness. I will have goodness. And I will have mercy. So he wants to bless us with good things, not bad things. And our Heavenly Father does not put sickness on us. You know, sickness is a bad thing. Just in case anyone is unclear, sickness is a bad thing. He wants to bless us with healing. He wants to bless us with divine health. Acts 10 and verse 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing what? Good. And healing how many? All. He went around doing good and healing all. He went around doing good and healing all. And my Bible says in Hebrews 10, 38, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So then he went around doing good and healing all. And what is he doing even today, even in 2021, even in the midst of this crazy, nutty culture? Doing good and still healing how many? All who were under the power of the devil because God was with them. He went around doing good and healing all. So healing is a good thing, and it is for us. It is the will of God. Have complete and total confidence when you come to God and ask Him to heal your body. Our Heavenly Father wants to hear us. He wants to answer us. He wants to wonderfully provide. And we know His will by His Word. Matthew 9.35 Jesus went through all the towns and villages preaching, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every, how many? Every disease and sickness. He went about teaching and preaching and healing, healing every disease and sickness. This is who he is. He is our helper. This is who he is. God's will, even under the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, his will, even under the Old Testament or Old Covenant, was health and healing. And in Christ, we have a new covenant with the superior high priest and better promises. But you have to have the eyes of faith to see it from the Word of God. Even before Jesus came, God's will was health and healing for His people. And we have now in Christ, it's what Easter is all about, what He did on our behalf, the price He paid, we have a superior high priest with better promises. But let's look at the Old Testament before Christ ever came. Exodus 15 and verse 26. If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any. Say any. any. I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And there he introduced one of his names, which is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God, our healer. So we know his will by his word. We also know who he is by how he has revealed himself. And he is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord God, our healer. He is not the Lord God who makes us sick. He is not the Lord God who makes a child sick to teach him a lesson, as some religious people say. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God, our healer. And he told his people, the King James says, none of these diseases will come upon thee. Say, say none of these diseases, none of these diseases 
So it may affect the world. It may affect your neighbor, but it does not affect me. It may affect the world, but it does not affect my family. I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Say, none of these diseases will come upon me. Say, none of these diseases will come upon my family. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Say, I thank you that you are the Lord who healeth me. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for healing me. And you might say, of what? Of whatever it is. None of these diseases. Say this, say, I am exempt from what plagues the world. See, we, we've forgotten this. You know, everybody thinks because it's 2020 or 2021 that Psalm 91 is no longer in our Bibles. But under the old covenant, before Jesus ever came, the plagues of Egypt had no effect on the children of God in Goshen. When it was dark in Egypt, there was light in Goshen. So whatever is going out, on out there in the world, it has nothing to do with me or with my family. And it doesn't affect me. And that's why I'm not going to live by and operate by whatever the world's doing. And I'm not going to live at their level. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. you are the Lord who healeth me. Look over at Exodus 23, verse 25. Worship the Lord your God, and His blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you. So this is the prayer that all the children at St. Paul's are taught. Exodus 23, 25. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you bless our bread and water, and you take sickness and disease away from our midst. Say, say thank you, Heavenly Father, thank you, Heavenly that, you Father. that you take sickness and disease and infirmity and every physical problem and every physical challenge away from me. And then you see verse 26 that he wants to give us a long and full life. Look over at Psalm 103, beginning in verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. And again, as I said yesterday, if Austin Lingerfeld is ignorant of God's will in any area of life, who is responsible? Austin is. And if Austin Lingerfeld is ignorant of the will of God, who is responsible? Austin is. Now, I'm using myself as an example so no one feels like they're being picked on. Amen? And if Austin Lingerfeld is ignorant of the benefits that we have in Christ, who is responsible? And it's sad when you realize there are a lot of believers and they don't know the benefits. And it could be because they've never been told or it could be because they've never taken the time to read the Word of God for themselves. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins. How many of our sins? All. Oh. And praise God for it. Amen. And that's one of the things that we remember and we celebrate on Easter. But there's more to the atonement than just our sins being forgiven. He forgives all of our sins and He also heals how many of our diseases? All. And all means all. Just as much as He forgives all of our sins, He heals all of our diseases. So say this, say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for your benefits. Say, I thank you that every benefit you have and every benefit Jesus paid the price for it belongs to me. I thank you. You forgive all of my sins. I thank you that you heal all of my diseases. I thank you that I am blessed, that I am healthy, that I am whole, that I am walking in divine health, and that none of these diseases have any right have any place, have any authority in my physical, mortal body. And then if you have family, you have children, you pray the same way over their lives 
and over their physical bodies. Then you come over in the New Testament, Peter puts in the past tense, which is what is in the present in the Old Testament. Look at 1 Peter 2.24. He himself, referring to Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Say, I have been healed. Have been healed. Say, my healing, my healing belongs to me because Jesus paid the price more than 2,000 years ago. Say, say this, say, I'm not going to get healed. Say, I am healed. Say, I have been healed. Say, by his wounds, I have been healed. I say, I'm not trying to get it. I'm not trying to work for it. Say, Jesus paid the price. So I have it. So it belongs to me. Say, it has my name on it. Say, I have been healed by the wounds of Jesus. Now, the next thing to do is you got to act like it. And that's why pastor's always teaching and has been teaching this week on releasing your faith by taking action on the Word of God. If His Word is true, we just have to take action. And part of the way we take action and receive the good things our Heavenly Father wants us to have is to just thank Him for what His Word says. To thank Him for what His Word says. Didn't bring the reference, but in the Old Testament it talks about reciting our verses for the king. I've told you, whatever it is you're, the need is you're praying about to find two or three scriptures. I just gave you more than that on healing and healing being a benefit that belongs to us, amen. And so we can pray, we can petition, or we can just also stand on his word and thank the Lord we have it because we do. And you thank him that you have it, you thank him that it's yours, you thank him that it belongs to you, and then you just walk in it with the joy of the Lord. We ask, we receive, and our joy is complete. Now this is why every one of us, we all need to renew our minds to the word of God. It is amazing on the issue of healing and Jesus healing all or Jesus healing every. It is amazing how often God's word says all or every. But so many believers simply don't know what the Word says. So many believers simply don't know what belongs to them. Their covenant rights, their covenant benefits, their covenant privileges. But you got to get in the Word of God and find out what belongs to you. And when you do that, point number five, you can pray with confidence, knowing our Heavenly Father wants to give you good things. Good things in your family, good things in your finances, good things in your health and in your physical body, good things in every area of life. It is a joy to serve the Lord. Amen. It is a joy to serve the Lord. Amen. And He wants to do more good things in our lives in 2021 than He did in 2020. We'll have to hit the pause button right there. I want to thank you for being here today. God bless you. And I'll see you tomorrow at noon on the dot. God bless you as you go. And don't forget about tonight at 7 p.m.